Hey there. If you're not aware, on Sunday night, Bolivia experienced a political earthquake. Evo Morales, the longest serving president in Latin America, resigned. And in honor of that, today I'm going to be presenting, in unproduced form, three dumb things about the coup in Bolivia. Now, I'm no expert on Bolivia. I've followed it with some interest over the years, and Evo Morales is a fascinating character, but uh, I really don't have any kind of special knowledge here. I don't want to pretend to. I've actually been really frustrated by the coverage over the past couple days. It seems like exactly the people who you'd expect to be celebrating this are celebrating this, and exactly the people you'd expect to hate this, hate this, and there's just, there's just seems to be no recognition that this is a tremendously complex event with good things and bad things about it. And I would say mostly bad things, but once again, I can't really tell because it seems like everybody's just spitting their ideology rather than actually engaging with the arguments of the other side. Um, but there are a few things that I've been able to glean that I think are worth sharing with you, so I'll uh, get into it. So the first dumb thing is that nobody's calling it a coup. This is a coup. It, it absolutely is a coup. Evo Morales resigned on Sunday night when he lost the confidence of his military and his police forces. Uh, one of the generals uh, actually suggested that he resign, and he did so. That's a coup, folks. I mean, that that's what happened here, and it's incredibly frustrating that most news outlets in the United States won't call it what it is. That's just what just the first and most obvious example of this sort of ideological, these sort of ideological blinders that everybody seems to have on right now. What happened in Bolivia was a coup, and in order to begin talking seriously about what happened there, we have to acknowledge that. Now, I'm not saying that a coup is always necessarily a bad thing. Um, there are great examples of coups that, well, not a ton, but there are examples of coups that are a good thing. Uh, I would put in that category from just this year the military coup that ousted uh, the long-term dictator of Sudan. He had been there for 30 years. Uh, he'd been incredibly repressive, killed millions, he's a war criminal. Uh, millions might overstate it, but maybe not. Anyway, the guy in Sudan, really bad guy. He got taken out in a coup, and that was a good thing. Um, Mubarak in Egypt, even though the <laughs> following consequences of that were not very good, I would think, I, I would guess that a coup was the only way to get him out after his 30-year dictatorship. So yeah, I mean, coups are coups. Call them coups. Then we can talk about whether or not they are good things or bad things. My sense now, once again, not claiming to be an expert, but my sense now is that this was a bad coup. This was not a good thing. There are factions within Bolivia that had very legitimate complaints against Evo Morales. I'm going to talk about that in a bit, but this was not the way to handle this situation. In the Sudan example, in the Egypt example, where, where coups were a good thing, uh, these were people who had been in power uh, unaccountably for decades. Evo Morales was in power for decades, but he was re-elected multiple times in elections that are widely seen as free and fair. The, even the election that was uh, in dispute in recent weeks is something that was largely seen as free and fair. There's a lot of disputes about whether this particular one might have been fraudulent, might have been abused, but the only reason we're having these disputes is because international observers have been allowed in to look at the results. This is not some dictatorship where there's, there's no international influence, no international observation. Evo Morales was popularly elected multiple times. He was not a dictator. He was a guy with a real national mandate. Um, there's definitely very open questions about whether or not he should have been running this time, for sure, but he was the elected president. Now he's not there. He and almost everybody in his government have felt it necessary to resign for their personal safety. Bolivia right now has a really frightening power vacuum, and it's quite possible that all manner of awful things could happen. Who knows? Maybe it'll all be fine. Some perfectly benign person will come in as a caretaker. There'll be elections. It'll all be great. But that's not what it looks like right now. We've got uh, really frightening individuals coming in and claiming that they can take power now. We've got 
um, you know, police running around saying that they can arrest uh, the president that just re just resigned with no real authority behind that. It's terrifying stuff. It, Bolivia had a system that was constitutional and, if abused, but was constitutional, and now it doesn't. Uh, so yeah, this was a coup. This is a bad thing. We should start our conversations talking about that. Let me say again just how frustrating it is, how uncovered Bolivia seems to be. I've been reading the New York Times articles on the country, but the New York Times articles are written by some guy who's sitting in Brazil. It's amazing just how little time and effort we dedicate towards covering the countries south of the U.S. border. I mean, there's, uh, there's not enough investment in, in reporting resources in the Middle East, honestly, but they've got infinitely more resources dedicated to those countries so, so far away that, 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 that in any sensible definition of national interest, uh, the United States should be less interested in than Latin America. It's, it's crazy to me that people are covering this, this earthquake in Bolivia from Brazil, and we're supposed to take that seriously. Syria is another topic that's just as controversial as what happened in Bolivia on Sunday night, but at least there's a volume of coverage there. Um, I can go through, I can look, I can, I can weigh separate claims, I can, I can see what looks like, like it's bullshit and find out support for why that's bullshit. With Bolivia, it's so thinly covered that you really just have these two ideological stories that conflict completely and seem to be describing different countries, and it's, it's really frustrating. The second dumb thing is the way that Evo Morales has clung to power and held onto it. There are a lot of people in Washington, D.C. right now who are acting as if this situation in Bolivia and Evo Morales are the same thing as Maduro in Venezuela. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, Maduro still has his passionate defenders, um, and I certainly don't believe that the United States should be doing anywhere near as many things against him as we are doing, but, but anybody who's honest has to acknowledge that Maduro and Chavez before him have made an incredible wreck of Venezuela. There are some countervailing things, but the place is a mess. Um, it has proven to be incapable of running under their system without the uh, historically high oil prices that, uh, that Chavez had during his reign. Um, otherwise, it's just simply not viable. That is not the case in Bolivia. The, 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 the truly tragic thing about what happened on Sunday was that if Evo Morales had simply not run in this election, or possibly if he hadn't run in the election before that, he would have been remembered as one of the greatest leaders in Latin American history. Morales has been in power for most of two decades, and that experience for Bolivia has been an extraordinarily positive one. GDP per capita in Bolivia has tripled under Morales. And what's really interesting about these figures is if you look at that, it looks sort of similar to what was happening in other successful Latin American countries. But he did this while he also nationalized some petroleum resources and did some real redistribution in the country. So not only uh, was GDP per capita rising, not only was the pie getting bigger, it was actually getting better distributed. Also, a really important aspect of this, once again, I'm not an expert on Bolivia, but my understanding is that it is one of the countries in South America, I think it is the country in South America with the highest indigenous population. And historically, this indigenous population has been um, just brutalized and marginalized and, and kept out of things. Evo Morales is actually a member of that indigenous population, and he has done an extraordinary amount to, to, to raise that population up and give them access to resources and uh, participation in the government of Bolivia. So Evo Morales has had an extraordinarily successful time in government. He's been re-elected multiple times, very democratically, and he's done a, an incredible amount of good for his country. I am not somebody who leans towards socialism. Uh, honestly, in many instances, I, I tend to oppose it, but I am somebody who leans towards results. And the results in Bolivia have been extraordinary. It's been one of the happiest stories 
uh, over the past decade or so. Uh, Bolivia is traditionally one of the poorest and unhappiest countries in the Americas, and it's really taken some, some uh, tremendous strides forward under Evo Morales. And that's what makes his behavior over the past, I don't know, half decade or so, just so disappointing. Uh, in the early years of his tenure, uh, there was a new constitution put forth for Bolivia that you know made tremendous progress uh, for, for everybody, yada, yada. And in that constitution, there were term limits imposed. Um, he decided that those term limits shouldn't apply to him. Um, he had a referendum on whether or not uh, those term limits should apply to him, and he lost the referendum. The Bolivian people were like, no. We've had enough. You should not run again. Um, and then he got uh, some court to say that he had a human right uh, to run again. The term limits somehow violated uh, human rights. That's uh, certainly an odd, uh, odd ruling. Uh, I've heard it. Uh, I've seen it written that uh, this court was packed with his supporters, but I'm not sure that really is that important. I mean, he was the president. If he gets to appoint people to courts, then... You know, that's what happens when a guy is a president for a while, so I don't think that's necessarily that relevant. But it is ridiculous that he has clung to power in the face of the Constitution and in the face of a referendum saying that he should not run again. Um, I think there's a lot that could be said about the election uh, that took place uh, this past month, but uh, I don't want to dive into that because what I'm reading is honestly too conflicting. You know, the New York Times and the Washington Post are very confident that uh, this was fraudulent, but they don't really dive into the details. Um, I tried reading the Organization of American States report that came out on Sunday that, uh, that sort of prompted uh, this whole cascade of events that ended up with Morales' resignation, but it's only in Spanish, uh, or at least it was last night, and I couldn't really, my Spanish isn't that great. And there are conflicting reports that actually say that, uh, yeah, there might have been a, a technical problem, but the election looks like pretty much what we would have expected, and it actually wasn't fraudulent. And yeah, there is at least um, half the country, or, or almost half of the country, really loves Morales. And this is not... Uh, this is, this is a system where there's multiple fragmented uh, parties. This guy won the most votes by far in the first round of the elections. And if there were a second round, he might have won again. So yeah, I don't feel confident speaking to the fraudulence or the non-fraudulence of the past election. And that's another aspect that makes me uh, irritated about the fact that uh, Evo Morales was forced to resign. He actually granted a lot of the demands of the protesters and of the generals. He was willing to rerun the entire election. Um, that was supposedly what they wanted, right? It's funny, as I run through this again, I find myself getting more sympathetic to Evo Morales. Yes, it is bad and it is stupid that he didn't choose a successor, that he probably was getting into that strongman mindset where he, he didn't want to set up any other power bases within his own party and movement. And that's a real shame, but God, I, 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 I still think it's better than a coup. Uh, especially when you've got a guy who was elected multiple times, who on Sunday said he was willing to rerun the election. We could have had an actual system that continued to work in Bolivia instead of the chaos that we see right now. So with the first two things I was talking about, I'm not very confident. I just don't know enough. But with this third thing, I am confident and I do know enough. The third dumb thing about the coup in Bolivia is the U.S. response to it. Uh, over the past couple days, we've seen a lot of stuff from the U.S. government that just isn't helpful. Uh, we've got uh, Republican senators like Marco Rubio and Tom Cotton celebrating the fact that this guy uh, had a coup carried out against him. Um, we've got, uh, I believe we've got the State Department on record now saying, oh, it's not a coup. It's definitely not a coup. Um, we've certainly got State Department press releases talking about how confident they are that the election was fraudulent. Um, we've got, I believe the president is on record talking about how great this is. Uh, you've got a lot of sort of Washington, D.C. figures, supposedly, you know, more liberal-leaning Democratic types talking about how great it is that we've overthrown another dictator or what have you. It is 
really, really, really frustrating to watch because it is such a concrete reminder of the way things used to be in Washington, D.C. and the way that uh, our relationship with uh, the countries south of the border used to be. Um, and unfortunately, now, the way it looks like they are again. What I'm talking about is this assumption that the United States can just sort of do whatever it wants um, and, and, and can feel entitled to overthrow governments in Latin America that it disagrees with. Um, that's a really, really bad idea, and it's a bad place to find ourselves back in. And, and I'm afraid that the, the approach to this, to this coup in Bolivia is a great indicator of that. It's like the 1980s again. So the Organization of American States, a multilateral organization that many countries in the Americas belong to, played a huge role in the events on Sunday. They released a report saying that aspects of the October election in Bolivia were fraudulent. And that set off this sort of cascade of events that ended up with Morales' resignation. Um, there are a lot of people on Twitter who are super convinced that uh, this uh, OAS report is a CIA plot. There's a whole bunch of other people on the other side who think that that's just outrageous. Um, I don't think that is an outrageous claim to make if you know anything about the history of the Organization of American States. Um, it is quite rational to, uh, to, to suspect that they're acting as a tool of American foreign policy when they take such a, such a massive outsized role in the overthrow of a Latin American government. That is absolutely, absolutely something we should be suspicious of. But you know what? It could also be completely legitimate. It could have been um, a, a legitimate effort. I can't really speak to that, and I don't want to be overconfident about, about that. So I can't say for sure that the United States was actively involved in making this coup happen. There are a lot of elements in Bolivia that legitimately dislike Evo Morales and dislike the fact that he was going for uh, what looked like permanent power uh, in the face of what the Constitution and a referendum said. So yeah, I, I think we should probably back off on that too. We can't say for sure that the U.S. government uh, was involved in making this happen. But what we can say for sure is that it really looks like we did. And uh, especially to people in Latin America who've had to deal with uh, centuries of this kind of bullshit from the United States, they are completely within their rights to be suspicious, to be angry, and to be very worried that we're going back to the bad old days. Uh, I'm going to do something here that I don't think I've ever done before and uh, actually talk about a foreign policy success of uh, George W. Bush. Um, I don't know that it was an intentional success, um, but uh, it was a success nonetheless. During Bush's time in power, a range of governments in Latin America elected uh, very left-wing politicians. I've heard it called the pink wave. I've heard it called that a lot uh, in the past week. I've never heard it called that before. But you've got uh, Lula in Brazil, Chavez in Venezuela, Correa in Ecuador, um, the Kirch I think the Kirchners were already screwing things up in Argentina before that. But yeah, there was this wave of left-wing governments that came to power in Latin America. And yes, it does seem likely that the Bush administration, or is it just completely established, that the Bush administration uh, tried to carry out a half-assed coup against uh, Chavez uh, in Venezuela in 2004. But other than that, they mostly just sort of, you know, sort of, sort of grimaced and bore it and sort of moved on. Um, Latin America elected a whole bunch of left-leaning politicians, and uh, there were no U.S.-backed insurgencies. Uh, there were no U.S.-imposed civil wars. Um, there was, you know, a half-assed coup, but then it turned out that these folks were too popular for a half-assed coup to beat them. Um, so the U.S. just sort of stepped back and gave up. And this did happen under the Bush administration. And that was a fantastic thing, not just in, in, uh, in terms of human freedom and, and whatnot, but also worked out really well for U.S. policy and U.S. reputation in Latin America. 
Um, not in such a way that, you know, it would be sort of loudly acknowledged or trumpeted, but in the 1980s, I mean, the United States was involved extraordinarily negatively in every Latin American country, it seemed like. I mean, just, you know, with civil wars, with coups, with this, that, and the other thing. And that stepping back gave Latin America the freedom to develop and even develop in ways that uh, were, weren't necessarily opposed to the interests of the right-wing elements of the United States. Rather than have some sort of one-size-fits-all, corporate America-approved version of Latin American leader, folks went in different directions. And in some cases, like Bolivia and, I believe, Brazil, things went really well. Um, you know, the economy did really well. Um, some of the left-wing elements uh, that were that were brought into the government were tremendously helpful. I mean, I'm thinking about Lula's Bolsa Familia program that apparently really helped with inequality in Brazil, one of the most unequal countries in the world. I'm thinking of um, uh, Evo Morales' incredible legacy in Bolivia. In some places, it didn't go very well. Um, Argentina has been a nonstop disaster under the Kirchners. And... Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, they got a right-wing guy who's also failed to clean up their mess, and now sort of the legacy of the Kirchners has returned. Venezuela, the left-wing approach, was disastrous. But regardless, um, Latin America was allowed to hold on to its freedom and make its own decisions, and in that process become, I believe, much less angry at the United States. Um, what, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, Ecuador, uh, Brazil, um, briefly, I think it's now over, Argentina, all of these countries, you know, after trying out this left-wing thing, some of these experiments were quite successful, some were not, um, you know, switched back to very U.S.-friendly, right-leaning governments. It was fine. We didn't lose a country because we let a left-wing person govern it. It turns out it was dramatically better for these countries and for the world when the United States wasn't sticking its nose into the business of every country in Latin America all the goddamn time. It was tremendously successful, not just from the perspective of those countries, but also from the perspective of U.S. diplomacy, U.S. business, and just sort of general success and prosperity from the United States, from Canada all the way down to the tip of Argentina. Uh, it was great, and we now seem to be throwing that away, like for nothing. Just because, uh, you know, it's somehow seen as beneficial for some Republican senators in our Republican administration to pretend they have big swinging dicks against socialism? It's, it's idiotic. Um, it's, it's really throwing away 30 years of goodwill, like, for no reason. Anyway. I found this whole process uh, in Bolivia to be quite frustrating and, uh, again, probably most frustrating because it's hard for me to really figure out what's going on there. Anyway, uh, you may be wondering why we've got another produced or live video here, and that is because I have published a book called Avoiding the British Empire. And uh, uh, next week, if all goes to plan, you should have way more produced videos than you will know what to do with. So much content coming next week, all centered around this book, which you can actually buy now. It's called uh, Avoiding the British Empire. Um, it's sort of my book that like explains everything. I think it's uh, tremendously important, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with it. It's very thick. There's like 400 pages. Um, so yeah, you can, you can buy this now. Um, and I think there should be a link here, and I'd be grateful if you did. Um, thanks for watching. Please subscribe, and there will be more better produced videos next week. Um, thanks so much.